Good afternoon. So as the world's knowledge hurdles forward and the number, the number, the breadth, and the seriousness of the choices that students face will grow too. I'm gonna to try and argue today that we educators have a big blind spot. We teach material and we teach the connections among fields of knowledge if, if we're lucky, but we don't teach the art and skill of making good choices. So in this, I'm in the uh, somewhat uh, abstruse company of Bart Giamatti, the former president of Yale and the baseball commissioner, but also in the company of the world's most revered educator uh, who told his favorite student uh, that it's choices more than abilities that show us what we are. Uh, put a little less loftily, students need to understand how to organize information about probabilities, consequences, and the benefits and the costs of the options that are being balanced against each other. They need to be numerate and not just literate, and so that means being skeptical of quantitative propaganda. And they need to know when it's time to combine uh, cold reason and warm emotion and decide. So as we expand our educational offerings, uh, one or more courses that challenge students to take justified pride in decision-making ability can help make all the rest of the information that bombards them into their ally. Now we all know well that information and access to it is the great success story of the last half century. When I saw my first grown-up feature film in 1968, we were told that by 2001, 14 years ago, we would have uh, tourist vehicles in Earth orbit, manned missions to Jupiter, uh, and the iPad. And so we're going one for three uh, in that. Uh, but we've, of course, recently done far better, and we have in our pockets a tiny version of uh, commander data with access to more information than the Library of Congress had uh, just a few years ago. Siri, who is the real voice of Siri? Long before experts were coming up with the nanotube or the semiconductor, even long before the internal combustion engine, there were principles of decision theory being uh, explored and codified. So this is old knowledge, but the problem is it's not being taught anymore. And it needs to be imparted fairly early. Every time in the last 30 years of advising elected and appointed officials uh, in my field of environmental science and health that I've tried to explain that there's a time-honored way of making these decisions, I've been rebuffed. I must be a pretty good decision maker already, Sonny Boy, or I wouldn't have been elected or appointed to the job that I'm in. Uh, making wise decisions is not inborn or easy or intuitive. So I'm gonna try and compress a semester into 10 minutes covering just some of the principles of decision making under uncertainty. What could go wrong or go right if I make this choice? How likely is each outcome and how well or poorly can I estimate those probabilities? How will I or the people I work for or represent be affected by each possible outcome? And finally, most importantly, what choice gives you or the people you lead or represent the best chance of gaining what you most value without risking unduly what you can least afford to lose? These are the kinds of questions that excellent decision makers ask. And we confront these choices in our personal life or in public life. For example, as, as a possible cancer patient, how would you think about taking a drug that on average would extend your life by a year but had a one in 10 chance of taking two years off your life? What if you were the head of the EPA or advising her and considering requiring a, a expensive regulation on coal-fired power plants uh, that might save a thousand people across the nation from premature death, uh, but might cost a billion dollars and cause the utilities to have to lay off hundreds of workers? So I'm gonna offer seven very quick reminders that express some of the skills and attitudes that great decision makers embody, set them apart from the pack. I think these are the skills that we should ensure that every high schooler uh, has some exposure to. One, wise decision makers don't get depressed when things go wrong and they don't get smug when things go right. So the guy over here, pointer's not working, but that's Ricky Rubio, not Marco Rubio. He's making a, a, a very good pass, his shot is, uh, is uh, stymied, and even though this guy is probably uh, not gonna catch the pass, it looks like he's done the right thing. Uh, in contrast, this mission accomplished banner, of course, is notorious for having declared victory uh, way too soon. So if you'd rather be lucky than smart, maybe you shouldn't be making decisions for other people. Uh, in the early days of the space shuttle program, NASA managers apparently convinced themselves after 24 successful flights in a row that the O-rings on the shuttle's rockets were acceptably safe. But risk analysts within the agency had already estimated the chance of a fatal mishap at about one in 25. So the Challenger disaster on mission number 25 was somewhere between just what you'd expect and not unexpected. 
uh, wise decision makers see through quantitative lying. There are all kinds of ways of lying with statistics. Here's a quick one that you may not anticipate. Uh, according to noted uh, statistician Bill O'Reilly, uh, George Bush did more to help the poor than Bill Clinton did. That is the truth, and if you're not willing to acknowledge it, the conversation is over, because he brought down the poverty rate. Uh, so let's stipulate that, that uh, O'Reilly was not lying in any of the normal ways. These two rates were, uh, were correct. They're not so uncertain that the lower one could be higher than the larger one. The definition of poverty didn't change during the time period. And he wasn't using rates themselves to lie. I hope you can see it's possible for the poverty rate to go down, but the condition of the country to also go down because the poor are getting very much uh, poor, even though it's just a rate. Uh, but what uh, Bill did, either cleverly or cluelessly, was to connect that, those dots with a, a mental straight line. And it was just a teeny bit more complicated than that. Here's the actual picture uh, with the bottom of that V being the inauguration uh, in between uh, Clinton and Bush. A uh, much more consequential example, you may have all seen this, global warming. Uh, no global warming if you start in 1998, which until last year was the hottest year on record. Uh, but if you put that, uh, those 17 years into the 100 year uh, timeline, you see that it is not a plateau. It's part of a, of a trend that we've been on for quite some time. Uh, number three, they consider the untoward consequences of their own actions. Uh, in 2003, we invaded Iraq based on, to be charitable, I think, an extreme version of the so-called precautionary principle. As revealed in Ron Susskind's book, The One Percent Doctrine, the official policy of the administration was to treat the small probability there might have been weapons of mass destruction there uh, as if it was a certainty. Now, as I'll say at the end, there's nothing wrong with being extra worried about one possible outcome. But the terrible mistake comes, of course, when you ignore other terrible outcomes, such as the human and financial cost of prosecuting a war. Uh, our new book, by the way, concluded that regulations uh, tend to create about as many jobs as they, as they kill, but it's important to think about both and, and who's being affected. Uh, four, they refuse to make decisions that are only valid for a hypothetical average person. Uh, we build door frames to be about seven feet high, even though the average height of an adult is about five and a half feet, because we want to accommodate nearly all people. Uh, but some critics say that it's socialism or, or worse to try and reduce air pollution levels so that asthmatics can exercise along with the rest of us. Uh, that's why I was recently somewhat stunned to see that uh, Sodexo, the food service provider in my daughter's uh, former public school district across the river, was uh, passing out a fact sheet from the FDA about mercury and tuna fish, uh, verbatim what the FDA said, but they omitted just one sentence, the sentence which said, uh, it's a very strong function of body weight, and little people should eat about half as much uh, mercury and therefore about half as much tuna fish as uh, adults should. That was deleted from the fact sheet. Uh, by the way, fish also has brain food, so you shouldn't avoid it entirely, but a piece of salmon has about four times the omega-3 content and about a tenth of the mercury content as tuna fish. Uh, five, they're not paralyzed by too wide a spectrum of choices, but they're not content with a constipated set of options. Creative analysts, when they're asked to find the better of two options, will often ask ambitious questions about how we can do better still. But government and industry coexist in order to limit these questions. So when concerns have arisen about endocrine disrupting chemicals in plastic water bottles, they set about to define acceptable levels of one substance and then the next one that came along to substitute for it. Uh, if instead we tried to rephrase the entire endeavor, not as let's build a less unhealthy plastic bottle, but let's try to deliver cold water to people without necessarily uh, creating 29 billion new single-use containers every year, we might nudge the market towards an infrastructure that takes a product that after all falls from the sky and delivers it to consumers in a different way. Six, they guard against treating outcomes that appear similar as identical. Even when the odds of harm are the same for all people, we need to give people latitude to express their, and experience their harm in their own reasonable ways. So a European colleague of mine, Gerd Gigerenzer, has written journal articles uh, fairly sarcastically saying that thousands of Americans died, quote, needlessly after 9-11 because they chose to drive rather than fly in the year or two after the event. Now, the per mile odds of death in a car uh, are indeed higher than, than in an airplane. But this is a mathematical straitjacket that presumes that everyone should be no more adverse to the kind of, of hideous demise that people experienced on 9-11 than to a, a, a car crash. And finally, they refuse to balance uncertainties in thoughtless or worse yet coercive ways. So in my field of safety, health, and environmental regulation, the improvements all cost money, and I do think we, we can and we have to consider uh, the benefits along with the costs. 
But both of these are highly uncertain, and there's an infinite number of possible and acceptable ways to compare them. So suppose you're trying to decide whether to leave your house to catch a plane, and you believe that on average it'll take 45 minutes to get from your door to the gate. On a good day, it might take 20 minutes. On a bad day, it might take two hours. It turns out you should use the so-called best estimate of exactly 45 minutes before takeoff, but only if your goal is to minimize the time between when you get to the gate and the plane takes off without regard to which comes first. So if you were five minutes <laughs> early last time and, five, and four minutes late this time, and you patted yourself on the back for getting closer to the right answer, then the best estimate is the right one for you. But the more important the flight is to you and the less important what you would be doing uh, at home if you left uh, too early, the more time you will allow. And I think that's how we should balance uncertain costs to business with uncertain benefits to citizens, by deliberately guarding somewhat uh, against the errors of providing too little protection uh, to public health. So if I had to reduce all seven to two, I'll try it with two. Uh, first, it's impossible to avoid imposing value judgments on these decisions. How precautionary should we be? How should we value each gain or loss? So don't let anyone ever tell you that they're offering, a, that you are making a value-laden decision and they are offering a value-free way not to. What they're really trying to do is to impose their values on you or the people that you're trying to serve. You can follow these two economists, uh, former professors of mine, their advice on the left. You can follow the 2,000-year-old advice on the right. Either way, it's up to you, but you're saying something very profound about what you value. And then secondly, don't confuse prediction with action, and don't confuse lip service about your values as living out those values. Uh, sure, we were all in the Nobelist who discovered the depletion of the ozone layer, said it much better. Uh, what's the use of developing the science if all we're willing to do is stand around and watch those predictions come true? Distilling even further to, to one, embrace your values and broadcast them so people know how you're deciding and why. Amass the facts in the information age with a real appreciation for the uncertainty in them. Ask bold questions about choices that people may not want you to realize are possible. And honor differences among people before you may inevitably have to view the population as a single whole. In other words, and with a little tweaking of these main terms, the one who has empathy, boldness, and numeracy is one in a million who can move the world. Thank you. Oh, my God.